Just two more minutes, Mara. There are some people who haven't joined. It's exactly 12.30. Two more minutes, Mara. So then we'll start. How many people are in the class? 21, Maharaj. There's not even half here. Yeah. Time has changed to 12, the actual time is 1 o'clock, Maharaj. So they will join in a few minutes. They're all from India? No, Maharaj. They're from Australia. They're from US from different parts of the world, South Africa, oh. UK, and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Only few are from India. All right. Under one minute, Maharaj, even if they don't join, you can start. You know, the recording is there, they will catch it up. Yes. Hare Krishna, Dhamma Pranams Maharaj, this is your servant Miro Gopal Das. Uh, very good to hear your voice, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Prabhu, welcome. How are you, Maharaj? I'm fine, thank you, Prabhu. How are you? Yeah, doing okay. You're still in Mayapur? Yes. Nice, nice. We must catch up at some point. <laughs> It's not so pleasant just now. We just have an outbreak of COVID. We've got more than 50 cases of COVID. Oh dear, I'm and so sorry. And people like Braja Vilas have got it, and Padmanayans yes. Padma got it, and uh, yeah. Marichi's got it, and oh my goodness. Uh, it's, it's in fashion these days, Maharaj. It's yes, in fashion, right? Indra Jumna <laughs> Swami also has it over in Vrindavan. It's catching on. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> It'll go away, Maharaj. I think once you've got it once, this this uh, variant, I, they say that your immune system builds up and then, you know, it's not as bad. So they say. <laughs> I don't know if it's a variant or if it's the old one. I don't know. Uh, uh, according to the test done till now, it's not a variant. Variant is not in my book. It's oh. only COVID. Oh. Very nice. So we, we still expect the variant then. So that's nice. Something to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> nice to. Nice to hear you, Maharaj. I'm looking forward to your association. Thank you so much. I think we're just about to start soon. Maharaj, I will start the recording. Okay. Om recording Magyan. in progress. Om Hare Magyan. Krishna, everybody. Once again, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, everybody. Please accept my humble obeisances. Welcome to the session. Unit 13 and Unit 14, as I have informed you earlier, His Holiness Bhakti Vigya Vinash National Maharaj will be facilitating, and Maharaj is starting right now, expecting all of your kind cooperation. As the session timing is changed from 12.30 to 2.30, I request everybody to be on time by 12.30. Thank you. Over to you, Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna, everyone. Welcome to our Bhakti Vai Bhav class on Kapila Shiksha. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksuran Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha sunyavadi paschacha desha tarine Vanchakalpa tarubhyascha kripa sindhu bhai evacha Patitanam pavan ebhyo vaishnavibhyo namo namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 
Ram Ram Hare Hare. So we have the wonderful opportunity to go through this final section of this first part of the Bhakti Vaibhav, which is Kapila Shiksha, eight or nine chapters we have for ourselves. So uh, we're beginning today chapter 25, which is the chapter which Srila Prabhupada lectured on while he was in Mumbai. I think it was Mumbai he was lecturing, either Mumbai or LA. Anyway, he Prabhupada lectured on it and these lectures are all transcribed there in the teachings of Lord Kapila Dev. Those of you who may like to look through the teachings of Lord Kapila Dev, you'll see Prabhupada's lectures on the 25th chapter. So we're not going to go in detail into this 25th chapter. Pretty much it will be an overview. There's so much, there's just so much that we don't have time to go deeply into it all. But we hope to enrich your understanding anyway. So I'm going to switch to the PowerPoint, which we have for this, and I hope it will be visible for all of you. Can you see it? It is visible, Maharaj. Oh, good. Okay. So 25 to 33, are, we're looking at these two units. Okay, there's the glorification from Sanatana Goswami. We'll just begin with the overview. Okay, so the, you've had already chapters 20 to 24. You've completed that. You heard about Devahuti and Kardama. And you heard also about the appearance of Lord Kapila Dev. That was described in the previous unit. So we're going to go on to this next section, Kapila Shiksha, and you can see the topics which will be covered in each of the chapters. Chapter 25, which I said Prabhupada lectured on, emphasizing the importance of Bhakti Yoga and telling us more about the nature of Bhakti. Then tw chapter 26 is like jnana yoga, but we could also call it sankhya. Sankhya is also jnana. Chapter 26 is really a description of all the different elements and how they come into existence. A lot of jnana. Chapter 27, we'll hear about the application of that jnana, how to get liberation how to become a jnani. Chapter 28, Astanga Yoga. Those of you who are doing Hatha Yoga or Astanga Yoga, you may find chapter 28 interesting. And then chapter 29, we're coming back to Bhakti and we're going to hear about how devotion can be in the gunas, influenced by the modes of nature and We'll hear also what is actually the standard of pure bhakti, pure devotional service. So that's chapter 29, that's an important chapter also for us. So we have a lot to look forward to. Um, pretty much it will be a chapter a day, I guess, a chapter each class. We only have two hours for the class, so we'll see how it goes. The first section, 25 to 30, 29 chapters are heavier, more philosophical. Chapters 30 to 33, not very difficult, shorter and quite graphic and dis descriptive. We'll hear about, chap from chapter 30, we hear about Tamagun. Then 31, we'll hear about Rajas and Tamagun. 32, we'll hear about Rajas Gun and Sattva Gun, and then we'll conclude with a description of Devahuti's devotion. That 
every, after Lord Kapil has finished all of his teachings and he's answered all the questions of Devahuti, then we'll hear how Devahuti, how she absorbs herself in the mood of devotion and what happens to her. Okay, so this is what we're going to be covering. So beginning chapter 25, the glories of devotional service. An overview from the chapter, right, begins with the introduction, what sort of we would expect, expect that, right, at the beginning there should be an introduction to the subject, and then we'll hear Devahuti's questions, what's her problem? Yeah, she's got problems. Like all of us, we all have problems. So Devahuti, she brought her problems to Lord Kapila Dev. And Lord Kapila is going to introduce her to Sankhya Yoga. Sankhya Yoga, not the Sankhya which the atheists talk about, but the Sankhya taught by Devahuti Putra, Lord Kapila. The atheist Sankhya is not what we're going to be looking at, but we will try to compare the two as we go through these chapters. And then, after introducing Sankhya, Lord Kapila Dev will highlight the position of Bhakti and the importance of association with devotees. Very important to get the association. So Lord Kapila is going to describe all of this to Devahuti. Then Devahuti has more questions. She's an intelligent woman. Intelligent people have questions, Prabhupada said. So Devahuti has some nice questions and Lord Kapila Dev will be answering them. Not only in this chapter 25, but he'll be answering some of the questions later in other chapters, in 26, 27, 28, 29. All right, so then the chapter concludes with a description of Sankhya, and it's described as a combination of devotional service and mystic realization. What is Sankhya? You can describe it like that. It's a combination of devotional service with mystic realization. Mystic realization, right? <laughs> it's about as puzzling as Sankhya. Sankhya literally means to count, right? To count the elements, but uh, it's a, the Sankhya which is described here by Lord Kapila Dev is a combination of devotional service along with mystic realization. We should connect this chapter with the previous section. Previous section you heard about Kardama Muni and Devahuti. And then in course of time they had children. And the daughters were all given in marriage, and they had the one son who Lord Brahma had told is going to be an incarnation of the Lord. So that child, of course, that's Lord Kapila. So Kardama Muni had decided that he would live with his wife up until they had the child. And once the, she got the son, then Kardama Muni was going to renounce and go off and go away anyway, renounce, take sannyas. I don't know if he'd actually take sannyas, but uh, <laughs> certainly he'd renounce everything. In a sense, that, sanyas, that is real sannyas, right? Not just change the dress, but actually sannyas. He gave up everything. He left his wife and he left his son, who is the incarnation of the Lord, and he goes off. So Shona Karishi desires to hear about the activities of Lord Kapila 
and his instructions on Sankhya philosophy. We're very indebted to Shonaka Rishi for his inquisitiveness. He always wants to hear these very interesting topics, very important topics, which make the whole theme of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So Sutta Goswami continues narrating the conversation which took place between Maitreya and Vidura. Here's the first verse. Would somebody like to read for me? I can read Maharaj. Thank you. But with the uh, Sanskrit? If you like, yeah. Okay. Shonaka Uvacha, Kapila Statva Sankhya Ta, Bhagavan Atma Mayaya, Jatak Svayam Ajak Sakshat, Atma Pra Japaye Nri Nam, Shri Shonaka said, Although he is unborn and the Supreme Personality of Godhead took birth as Kapila Muni by his internal potency. He descended to um, this mind, uh, the same mind. Disseminate. Uh, transcendental knowledge for the benefit of the whole human race. Okay, thank you. All right, so Shonika is descri describing the appearance of Lord Kapila Dave that he is the, the Supreme Lord, he's Bhagavan, and he is appeared by his internal potency. The Chit Shakti, the Lord comes. His, his body is not material, in other words. He has a spiritual form. And his purpose in coming? To disseminate transcendental knowledge for the benefit of the whole human race. And this transcendental knowledge is what we call Sankhya philosophy. Sankhya is one of the six different philosophical systems which are presented in the Vedic culture, along with other things like, you know, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras and Gotama's Nyaya and Jaimini's Karma Mimamsa, these things. So Sankhya is one of the six darshans. But that's usually referring to the atheistic uh, teachings, uh, the atheist Kapila, who deny the existence of God and say they, can, they declare life comes from matter. All right, so this is the, the purpose of the Lord coming into the world. Yeah, go ahead, Maharaji, you can read more. Maitreya said, when Kardama left for the forest, Lord Kapiva stayed on the stand, uh, strand uh, of the Bhim Sarovara to please his mother Devahuti. When Kapiva, who could show her the ultimate goal of the absolute truth, was sitting Leisure, leisurely before her, Devahuti remembered the words Brahma had spoken to her, and she therefore began to question Kapila as follows. Yes, right. Lord Brahma had... So, she's very anxious to take advantage. You have a son who is an incarnation of the Lord, then certainly it's a great opportunity to put questions and to get transcendental knowledge. Well, Lord Kapila is staying here at the, the Bindu Sarova. Lord Kapila's ashram is actually at Ganga Sagar. We will hear in uh, chapter 33 at the end of the Kapila Shiksha, we hear how Lord Kapila actually resides eternally at the Ganga Sagar, where the Ganga flows into the sea, into the ocean. 
And there's a big festival which takes place every year. It's called the Ganga Sagar Mela. And thousands of people go there. And it's coming up, I think it's mid-January. I think January the 15th is the actual date of the Ganga Sagar Mela. And devotees from Mayapur and Calcutta and different parts of India, they go there and they do book distribution and preaching also. I'm not very sure if they had it last year because of the COVID and I'm not very sure if they'll have it this year even <laughs> because of the COVID. But in the past, it, it's held every year. It's a very big event. But uh, with these kind of public events, it's, there's a risk always to health. And it's very easy for diseases like COVID to be spread. Anyway, just to tell you like that, that Kapila Muni's ashram is there at Ganga Sagar. But here, where he's instructing Devahuti, He's at the Bindu Sarova, which is a different place. All right, so Devahut, Devahut is approaching Lord Kapila Dev and she's describing her situation. Would somebody else like to read this verse for us? Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, I'll read. Thank you. Devahuti said, I am very sick of the disturbance caused by my material senses. For because of the sense disturbance, my Lord, I have fallen into the abyss of ignorance. Oh, fallen into the abyss of ignorance, right? So, Asad Indriya Karshanat. This is the problem, the senses, material senses. I'm and so Devahuti is very, very frank and and she's realized the cause of her uh, the cause of her disturbed 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 mind. The the cause is her material senses. Her senses are disturbing her. Why the senses are disturbing? Her senses always want enjoyment. They always want attention. All right, Prabhupada explains, senses, it's like a man having five wives. If you have five wives, then each wife wants to go to a different place. The tongue wants to go one place, the ear wants to go another, the eyes want to go a different place. Each of the senses demand their own enjoyment. And it, it's very disturbing to anybody any ordinary person who is struggling, trying to control their mind and senses. We cannot feel peace of mind in that situation. So Devahuti has approached Lord Kapila Dev, telling him about her situation. What should be done? Go ahead Prabhu, keep reading. Thank you Maharaj. We should know that beyond these temporary senses are our permanent senses, which are now covered by the material body. Internal sensory activities are called devotional Internal sensory activities are called devotional service, whereas temporary sensory, sensory activities are called sense gratification. Thank you. Yes. So we have these covering, there's a covering over our spiritual senses, our permanent senses. They're covered over by this material body. And it's a material body with the material senses which demand sense gratification. But we can remove that covering and we can experience actual sense uh, sense pleasure with our spiritual senses. And that is devotional service. Rishikena, Rishikesha Sevanam Bhaktir Puchate. Right? We use our senses in the service of the Supreme Lord, who is the proprietor of the senses. And in this way, we can actually 
have real sense pleasure, sense gratification. So Prabhupada explains this in our purport. Yes, someone else like to read? Hare Krishna. Unless one becomes tired of material sense gratification, there is no opportunity to hear transcendental messages from a person like Kapila. Devuti expressed that she was tired. Now that her husband had left home, she wanted to get relief by hearing the instructions of Lord. Yeah, this is a bit, okay. Okay, so tired. We have to become tired of sense gratification. And it's a very important point, right? And coming to Krishna consciousness. We should be tired of trying to enjoy the material world. When we're actually disgusted and uh, exhausted and trying to enjoy the material world, then we will be more qualified to hear from a person like Lord Kapila. So Devahuti has expressed that she was tired. Why was she tired? Well, for one reason, her husband had left home. And who was Devahuti? Who was her father? This is Ma Manu. Yeah, which Manu? Swayambhuva Manu, right? Yes. And so, she was coming from a very rich, wealthy family, very opulent family. She had given everything up to come and live with Kardama Muni. And Kardama Muni, where was he living? What kind of person was Kardama? Rich. Yes? He was living in a her hermitage, um, small place. <laughs> He was like a hermit, right? Yeah, living in the forest, in the jungle somewhere. He had his thatch, thatch cottage or some thatched hut somewhere. He was living a life of austerity. And Manu brought his daughter Devahuti there to marry him. So Devahuti gave up. She left behind her father's opulence to come and live with her husband in the forest, in the jungle, and to accept so many austerities. Of course, he was a great yogi, and he had wonderful yoga powers, and after they did some austerities for some period of time, then she expressed her desire to have a child, and Kardama then created the aerial mansion, and they went to visit many different places. They went to Mount Meru and they enjoyed places where the demigods go to enjoy. In this way they were having enjoyment and it, it, then it, in this, this way then they were able to have children. And she had her daughters, I think nine daughters and one son. But then with the children, then Kardama Muni decided he'd done his duty and it was time for him to leave home. And she was left with her son. Not an, of course, Lord Kapila, the incarnation of the Lord. So she, naturally she's feeling a bit, you know, tired. Of, you know, what kind of life is this? You know, my husband goes away, leaves me. We had children, all the daughters were given in marriage. And she's just left with this son. So she's tired of this. Uh, and they did have a lot of enjoyment. They really enjoyed, you know, in reading that section of the Bhagavatam. It's quite shocking to read about how, they, how much they enjoyed. Of course, we cannot understand their mood because they're very advanced personalities. We cannot really fully appreciate what is their mood, but certainly there was enjoyment there. But the important point is that to be tired of sense gratification is really a blessing 
because it makes us more qualified to hear. We hear, uh, I'm reminded of the verse by Queen Kunti. Queen Kunti said, those who are on the path of material progress cannot know me. Right? Janma Aishwarya Shruta Shribiya Edamana Madapuman Naivarhati Avidatum Vai Tuam Akinchana Gochara. So Akinchana Gochara, meaning material, materially exhausted. That we don't want any more, we're not endeavouring any more for material profit or adoration or distinction. We're finished with all that. You just want to find something higher than that. We want to look for something on a different level. And so Devahuti is in that condition. She's tired of material life and she's, she wants to hear the instructions of Lord Kapila. Here's a similar situation from the sixth canto. Of course, you haven't studied it yet in the Bhakti by Bhav, but still I'm sure many of you are familiar with the story of Chitra Ketu and how Chitra Ketu wanted to have a child and he got the blessings of Angira, Angira and Narada. So Angira told Chitra Ketu, when I first came to your home, I could have given you the supreme transcendental knowledge. But when I saw your mind was absorbed in material things, I gave you only a son who caused you jubilation and lamentation. So, similar situation. A similar situation that uh, the point is, yeah, we have Maharaj Chitra Ketu, after he had a son and after the son had died, then he was more able to take instruction from the great sage Angira. But while he was still thinking that he wanted a son, he wanted a son, he wasn't, he wasn't able to hear the spiritual instructions of Angira. So Angira came back to him. Angira returned to him after the son had already died and then he, he was no longer so, so attached to trying to enjoy the material world. He was ready to hear the spiritual knowledge. So that's an important point in, discuss, in presenting Krishna consciousness. So here's a little exercise for you. Are we able, how many people do we have in the class today? How many are here? Maharaj, 16 are there. All right, so then we can make eight pairs, all right? And everyone have a partner and we want you to share your realization of situation in your life. When you became more serious about self-realization, we've given you the example of Devahoti and also Chitraketu, so did you have any, did you have a similar kind of uh, situation like that, like a turning point in your life when you became a, a serious candidate in spiritual life? So just quickly, you know, I'll give you like five minutes just to, to think over this. Can I open the room's marriage? Yes, please. Hare Krishna. Is somebody in this room? Bhakta Asaf Kohan. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna. 
Raraj. Um, my camera is not working, I'm sorry. Okay. You can tell me. Did oh, you... I'm in the room with you, Maharaj. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. Oh, we have someone else also. No, no, I didn't realize that that you are participating in our in in the in the exercise. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I can tell about my experience when I um. There, I can tell about two two experiences. First, when I was accepted by my Guru Maharaj as his disciple, and then that was uh, um, maybe 15 years ago, maybe, or maybe 14. And then the second time is when I arrived in Mayapur three years ago with my family. And, um, and since then, um, my, uh, my dedication is more serious. And, um, so were there any particular factors uh, which happened, which brought about these changes in your spiritual life? Yes, my Guru Maharaj, that's the principal factor. What, he gave you some instruction or something? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. When, when, when we came to Mayapur, so um, his instruction to me was to, to study, study daily. And also, and also teach, study and teach, he says. And um, this, uh, although I have my service, and my service is as computer technician, but he said, but you should study daily. And that, that thing you should do to, till the, um, for the rest of your devotional life. So I could understand that this is something uh, this instruction I should take very seriously and I've been doing it and um, and it has results okay so um, this instruction he gave me also other instructions but this is the main instruction which uh, Oh, we have someone else in this room. Ras Shikhar Prabhu. Hare Krishna Mahajaji. Anjana Pranam. Hare Krishna Prabhu. There is some problem with, with my instrument, but I'm still trying that um, I got more serious when I first met, when uh, we met with, uh, when I met with my spiritual master, and he suggested in a group that we should focus on pure devotional service. And when he said that we should pure, we should focus on pure devotional service, and then I tried to understand what is pure devotional service, and then I, uh, it has changed my life altogether. That um, uh, we have to focus on nothing but the pure devotional service, and that is by association and by getting the uh, shastras and all these things. So it was the instruction of the, the pure uh, of my spiritual master, His Holiness Gopal Krishna Goswami Maharaj that uh, we should focus on pure devotional service. Okay. Okay. So both of you, similar situation. It came from instructions from your spiritual teacher. Yes, my it, it wasn't any personal crisis in your life or some big change or anything. It was just simply the instruction from the spiritual teacher. Okay, very good. Let's go back. Hare Krishna. 
Yes, I think we can close the rooms, bring everybody back. Okay, Maharaj. One more minute is left, Maharaj. Uh -huh. It's okay, just close the rooms. Yeah, I've, I've closed it. Oh, okay, good. Well, it takes one minute to close, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I understand. <laughs> I'll let you know after one minute is over, Maharaj. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think everyone's back in the room now. Recording in progress. Welcome back, everybody. Please go on, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. So, would somebody like to share with me what, what you discussed? Did you have any uh, real big change in your life or something which happened, which brought about your becoming serious in Krishna consciousness? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Uh, I'm Karuna Tara. Uh, can I, uh, can I say something about myself? Yeah, please do. Thank you, Mother. Thank you, Mother. Mother, actually, uh, after my son's death, I was uh, like break, I broke down, actually, because it was a very difficult time for me. At that time, I uh, didn't know what to do of my life. I thought I should end it. But then, uh, like, uh, my Prabhuji guided me. Uh, he gave me Gita Sa. He told me, that uh, only God can help you out. So at that time I started uh, reading, I, uh, I thought I should find some real purpose in my life. For that I started reading Bhagavad Gita and uh, and other Prabhupada books and other other spiritual books. This way my sadhana started. Oh, and, oh. so you, you had a real crisis in your life, you lost your son. Yes. And it brought, it brought you to Krishna consciousness. Eh? Yes, oh, okay, so that was Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Mataji, for sharing. There are two people who are raised hands, Maharaj. Dinesh oh. Prabhu, All right. Prabhu and Mahavir Prabhu. Three of them have raised hands. All right, let's hear from them. Oh, so many. Hare, Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Except my humble obedience of Lord Srila Prabhupada. Maharaj, I left South Africa you, you know, material prosperity, I moved to London, but when I got there and, you know, I saw the kind of life that the whole country was offering, and just the consciousness of the people, um, I became quite disgusted, but seeing devotees on the streets of London chanting, uh, it really impressed upon me. Then coming back to South Africa, my mom left the body and I ended up in a hospital. So that was like the final catalyst, you know, for me to think deeper about life. And, and that's how I kind of met devotees and uh, became more serious. Mm -hmm. If I could share uh, uh, my partner who we had the discussion with. Uh, so Chandrika Madhuti mentioned that, you know, um, it was the devotees doing book distribution uh, on the streets in Bulgaria. Uh, their whole demeanor, their whole attitude, um, she really felt very warm towards them and attracted to them. And that was her catalyst to join Krishna consciousness. Oh, Thank you, wonderful. Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. She was attracted by the devotees distributing books. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <laughs> very nice. Thank you, Prabhu. Right? right. So, someone else had their hand up? Yeah, Mahavir Prabhu. Mahavir Prabhu, yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, please accept my humble obeisances, Maharaj. So actually in my uh, breakout room, there was uh, Sachitanaya Prabhuji who expressed that when he was uh, doing studies in Russia, he actually thought that uh, in Russia, 
it is full of wealth and education and a lot of advanced technology is there but internally they were not happy and uh, then he realized that they are also hankering for the real happiness indians were thinking that they will go to advanced countries and they will get what they want and then they will be internal happiness but somehow that internal happiness was missing in russians as well as he himself because he found that uh, they are not happy after getting wealth education and technology so then he he started looking for where he can get uh, the avenues for self realization and then he joined the iskon society and he found that uh, there are more ways of getting internal happiness rather than this advancement in technology and wealth and all that and in my case maharaj i lost a job uh, multiple times in big mncs and that let me think that uh, i worked hard in mncs i worked hard in college and uh, got good uh, marks but somehow or the other uh, that uh, feeling of relaxation and uh, tension free mind was not there so i thought that what is the idea of working hard in an area which is not giving peace of mind <laughs> so then when i started hearing krishna katha in uh, iskon temple i started to realize lot of uh, relaxation in my mind lot of peace which i could never get anyways because so many mails were coming every day 300 400 mails were coming bombarding and so many escalations were there and it led it led me to think that why i am working so hard when i am not getting peace of mind so this krishna katha it relaxed my mind uh, greatly and i thought that this is a big relaxation in my mind which i could never have experienced in uh, while working with mncs oh wonderful wonderful thank you very much prabhu very interesting to hear all this thank very, you maharaj very nice all right okay so we will go back to our powerpoint here uh Okay so Devahuti is going to inquire from Lord Kapila Dev this will come this is their text 7 to 11 her different questions first of all she wants to dispel her illusion due to her false ego and created by your own maya so question 1 explain about prakriti and purusha and that's answered in text 12 to 27 Of course you've heard about Prakriti and Purusha also in Bhagavad Gita is also discussed here in Kapila Shiksha the relationship between Prakriti the material nature and Purusha the the enjoyer who is actually the Purusha Sankhya philosophy as is well known deals with Prakriti and Purusha Purush is the supreme personality of Godhead or anyone who imitates the supreme personality of Godhead as an enjoyer and prakriti means nature In this material world material nature is being exploited by the purushas or the living entities the intricacies in the material world of the relationship of the prakriti and purush or the enjoyed and the enjoyer is called samsara or material entanglement right so purusha actually the real enjoyer is lord krishna the supreme personality of godhead but as prabhupada explains anyone who's imitating the position of the supreme lord they're also purushas so we're all guilty of that we're little purushas we're all trying to exploit the resources of the material world and that's also described in bhagavad gita apariyam itvastvanyam prakritim vidime param jiva bhuta mahabaho yei dam daryate jagat Besides this material nature of mine Arjuna there is another nature which are all living entities who are trying to dominate trying to exploit the resources of the material world So a little question for you maybe some of you know the answer if you've gone over the the chapter and if you know the if you're familiar with the questions 
Can you explain why Devahuti said, my engagement in sense gratification was also due to you? She's addressing her son, Lord Kapila. Now why would Devahuti blame Lord Kapila that her engagement in sense gratification was due to him? Can anyone respond? Your hand is up. Hare I was, um, I haven't recently read, but if I, I remember that, um, I think she's referring to the fact that um, nothing, uh, or we cannot do anything without the arrangement and the sanction of the Lord. So ultimately, it's the Lord who's arranged for her to engage in sense gratification. I think that's what she is referring to, but I might be mistaken. Mm -hmm. and yeah, it, it's it's close. It's certainly close to pretty much close to the answer. Yeah, well, I'll just show you here. We have the the text actually from the from the purport, quoted from the purport, and it's explained here. The Lord is merciful. If anyone wants to forget Him and enjoy this material world, He gives him full facility. Not directly, but through the agency of His material potency, right? The Lord's material potency, in other words, through His Maya. Therefore, since the material potency is the Lord's energy, indirectly it is the Lord who gives a facility to forget Him. Devahuti therefore said, my engagement in sense gratification was also due to you. Now kindly get me free from this entanglement. <laughs> so, yeah, it, the Lord is in everyone's heart and He arranges for us to forget Him. Uh, if he, he can give us knowledge, He can give us remembrance, but if we want to forget Him, He facilitates that. And that allows us to enjoy the material world. So our, our sense gratification comes in that way. It's, you, we can say it's through the agency of the Lord's potency. What potency? That, that's maya. That's what we call the maya, the illusory potency. Where we forget Krishna and we're simply thinking about our own self. And we're thinking about our sense enjoyment. So this is the arrangement of Krishna. Krishna arranges it, not directly, but indirectly, through his material potency. Okay, going ahead. Lord Krishna is, goes on to describe the yoga system. Or Lord Kapila, rather. Lord Kapila goes on to describe the yoga system. And first point is that it's related to the Lord and the individual souls. Related to the Lord and the individual souls. We're all individuals and we each have a relationship with the Lord. Then second point, it's meant for bestowing the highest benefit on everyone. There has to be some good reason for doing something so here's the good reason, you get the highest benefit. Next point, it makes us indifferent to all so-called happiness and distress in this material world. We become indifferent to the so-called happiness and distress of the material world. Why? Because we're experiencing things on the higher plane. Happiness and distress is what's perceived by the mind and senses. It's temporary and it's illusory. But when we practice this yoga system, which Lord Kapila Dave is going to describe, we'll no longer become disturbed by it. We'll become indifferent to all of that. And one more point, it's serviceable and practical in every way. This is an important point, that the system of yoga which is taught, it has to be 
serviceable and practical. A lot of yoga systems are not so practical. You know, if you have to go away from the world, you have to go and live in a cave, and you have to shut yourself off from everything. But it's not that kind of yoga which Lord Kapila Dev is teaching. So it's serviceable. In other words, it's easily performed. We can do it. It's not. A, doesn't take a, a great effort to practice this Sankhya Yoga, and it's practical. Also, it's the, so. This is described in these two verses, thirteen and fourteen. Going ahead. Here's a quote from Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary describing yoga. Yoga concerning the Jeev Atma, Adi Atmika, is approved as the most beneficial method for oneself. Nisri Ashaya. It has three types Bhakti, Jnana, and Astanga Yoga. For bhakti, benefit for oneself is a secondary effect. Being situated in this yoga, one uproots material happiness and distress. So, understand the importance of bhakti. Bhakti is not for our own self. It's for the pleasure. We do devotion, we practice bhakti yoga for the pleasure of Krishna. Not for our benefit, not for what we're going to get. Devotee is not thinking, what will I get? The devotee does bhakti yoga in the mood of giving. And Prabhupada would often say, I did not come here to beg, I came to give. I came to give what you've all forgotten. So that's the mood of bhakti. It's a giving process. It's not something which we do just for our own benefit. Jnana Yoga, Stanga Yoga, these are not like that. But Bhakti is very different, of a different nature. And so we want to understand the uh, special benefit of Bhakti Yoga. And then the goal of Sankhya Yoga is to transfer one's consciousness and one's attachment from matter to spirit, from the body as oneself to the devotional service of the Lord. Consciousness is a crucial factor. Where, what is, where is our consciousness at? Now generally we're bodily conscious, it means we're very attached to the body, we're attached to matter. But the goal of Sankhya Yoga is to change that to change the consciousness from matter to spirit, from the body to the soul, and not just simply to the soul, but to, to engage in the devotional service of the Lord. So we, we're going to see now different stages which you have to go through in order to achieve that kind of consciousness. This is described here step by step in these verses, 15 to 18. First of all, we have to distinguish between matter and spirit, Krishna consciousness and Maya consciousness. Sometimes people don't understand what is Krishna consciousness and what is Maya consciousness. We have to distinguish what is for our sense gratification and what is for Krishna. So what is the body and what is the soul? That's the first thing. Then we should understand that the mind, the chetas, is the cause of bondage and liberation for the jiva. Attachment to the gunas causes bondage, but attraction for the Lord causes liberation. Again, we have to develop the attraction for for the Supreme Lord. We have to become attracted to Him. If we're not attracted to Him, if we're still attracted to the material world, how can we ever be liberated? So the mind is the cause of our bondage, but the same mind can liberate us. When we become attracted 
to the Lord. That is the cause of liberation. Then the next thing, we must understand how we have to purify our consciousness through devotional service. We can stop identifying ourselves as enjoyers and controllers and become situated in our constitutional position as Krishna servants. So purification of consciousness by engaging in activities of devotion. Take our consciousness off the body and bring our consciousness to the, into thinking, I'm a servant of Lord Krishna. I'm rendering service to the Supreme Lord. I'm not the enjoyer. I'm not the controller. I'm just a humble servant. That is purification. And then, by practice of knowledge and renunciation and devotional service, we will see everything in the right perspective and become indifferent to material existence and the material energy acts less powerful on him. So simply by doing devotional service, we automatically get knowledge and renunciation. Gyan and Vairag, they follow where there is real devotion. We see everything in the right way. We, we become indifferent. We're no longer attracted to the material world. And the material world doesn't have the same power on us because we're experiencing the higher taste. We have the higher consciousness. So the material world, just, just like pieces of broken glass, no longer attractive. We want to understand the position of bhakti, how it is supreme over all the other yoga processes. Described here in text 19, perfection and self-realization cannot be attained by any kind of yogi unless he engages in devotional service to the supreme personality of Godhead, for that is the only auspicious path. This is Lord Kapiladev's uh, powerful statement to Devahuti that you, you have to take up devotional service to the Supreme Lord. Any other process is not going to give you perfection. And going ahead, text 20, how to get bhakti, how to get devotion, because Devahuti is in that position, right? She wants to know. You know, I'm, she's tired, she's in a difficult situation, her husband's gone away, what's she supposed to do? So Lord Kapila Dev tells her, this very nice verse here, every learned man knows very well that attachment for the material is the greatest entanglement of the spirit soul. But that same attachment, when applied to the self-realized devotees, opens the door of liberation. So what is Lord Kapiladev telling his mother to do? Anyone can tell me? In simple word, simple sentence, what is Lord Kapila's instruction to Devahuti? Actually, uh, yeah, uh, maybe, yeah, please okay. go ahead. Hare Krishna. Uh, she wants to say that we uh, we should uh, get attachment uh, to the uh, self-reliant uh, personalities, uh, sadhus, and should uh, devote our life uh, for fulfillment of their instructions. Yes, right. Lord Kapil is telling us you have to get attached to a sadhu. You have to find some saintly person, some self-realized devotee, and you have to become attached to him. And will open the doors to liberation. Just a few minutes ago I was in one group and both the devotees were telling me how they got instructions from their spiritual teacher and it, it just changed their life. The one devotee, his spiritual teacher told him that he should just focus on pure devotional service and the other devotees told me how his spiritual teacher told him 
that he wanted him to study uh, the topic, study the science of devotional service and to study Prabhupada's teachings. And so it changed their life, just getting that kind of instruction. Of course, they must have had strong attachment for the, for the, the spiritual teacher in order to take that instruction to their heart. So this is important also. The attachment, there has to be that attachment. It, you must have that real faith and strong feeling for the person who is giving you instruction. And then you can properly dedicate yourself to that order. Many people may tell you things to do, you may not do them. You don't have the same regard for them. But if you have a strong attachment for that person, and they give you some instruction, then you'll take it very seriously. And here, in this text, this is text 21, this is a famous verse, often quoted, and one of the memorization verses, I'm sure, must be. And this describes the qualities or the symptoms of a sadhu. The symptoms of a sadhu, that he's tolerant, tatikshava, karunika, merciful, suridam sarvadehinam, friendly to all living entities, ajatra shatrava, he has no enemies, santa, he is peaceful, sadhava, he abides by the scriptures, and sadhu bhushana, all of his characteristics are sublime. Sadhu Bhushana, Bhushana, the ornaments of the Sadhu, all of his ornaments, his characteristics are very pleasing. So these are some of the, these are the external symptoms of the Sadhu. We, we could see these things, you can see manifest the nature of a person like that. There's external symptoms, there's also internal symptoms. Right? We heard here. No. Oh, well. No, there's others. Okay. It's a, another little exercise for you. You can work in pairs again, the same pair. You have your partner. You can do something here. Uh, what are some qualities of a sadhu which you find particularly inspiring? Some qualities. I, I think maybe just focus, give, give me one or two qualities. We don't want a lot of qualities. One at the most, two. You're two people, so you can give one each, which you find most inspiring. And then, how would you, how would you develop these qualities in the, yourself? That's the second part. If you felt, you felt inspired by that person's particular quality, how would you plan to develop that quality yourself? Do you understand the question? Recording stopped. Uh, Krishna Maharaj, may I ask one question regarding the qualities? Uh, there was one point, uh, uh, friendly to all living entities. So friendly to all living entities is the same as merciful or being uh, compassionate? Well, not exactly. Being friendly to all living entities, being a friend, hmm, is not necessarily the same as being compassionate. Compassion is a, a particular activity. You feel compassion for someone, someone's in a difficult situation, and you, you try to do something to help them, to bring them out from that situation. Just like people are suffering in ignorance, we try to enlighten them, that is compassion. Being friendly to all living entities means simply, you know, you, you're, you're not inimical to them, you're not harsh with them, you're not nasty to them. You have a friendly relationship with them. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, I just wanted to find out um, if we have questions on the specific verses that we are discussing, are we able to ask it? Yes. 
Okay, thanks, Maraj. Uh, shall I have a question, but shall I ask it after this discussion? Uh, well, have we, have we, has everyone gone into breakout rooms yet? No, Maraj. Okay, you can ask the question now. Okay, thank you, Maraj. So we were mentioning that, you know, when one gets tired uh, by, you know, material... Recording in progress. Uh, ...suits, or we get disgusted with material life, uh, then we come to devotional service, and we want to hear Krishna Katha. Sometimes, you know, uh, individuals or living entities um, can fall back and slip out. So in one sense, they discussed it, material life, become devotional service. But what would be the catalyst for them to leave devotional service and slip back into material life? Um, we sometimes have this, we find this, you know, in our congregation, for example. And then, so what are the reasons for them to slip back? And how can we bring them back? I just wanted to know your thoughts on that. Yes. Well, there are many reasons why people may go out of devotional service. And particularly when you're talking about a congregation, it's a little different when you talk about people who have actually moved into the temple as a full-time devotee. Someone comes full-time into Krishna consciousness but then somehow they may give up and go away again. It's a little easier for people who are just congregation. They haven't really fully committed themselves to Krishna consciousness. So they may come for some time and they're checking it out and trying it. And sometimes people come and they decide, no, Krishna consciousness is just not for me. And I just, I don't feel that this really what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something which is a bit more, uh, maybe not so demanding, maybe it doesn't have these rules, maybe these rules it will be difficult for me. And living as a congregational devotee it may be difficult for someone. And someone may also feel that I don't feel like I'm fitting in with the congregation. I don't feel like I'm really a part of the society, the institution, you know. I have difficulty making friends with the others there. And so they may decide Krishna consciousness is not for them. And someone else, you know, they, they may come to Krishna consciousness and they may come and live in the ashram and take up the full-time life, full-time commitment in devotional service, but then they may go again. Uh, and it may be that they were premature, they were too premature, they were not really ready for moving into the temple. So in the past we did like that, you know in the past we were very relaxed and people would come to the temple and maybe right away they would come and stay in the temple and they would stay for some time and then they would go away. Mm, they, they were, they were just restless people who didn't really know what they were committing themselves to. But in course of time, they began to understand that the serious commitment is required in this. And they may not be ready to fully commit themselves to it. Therefore, they go away. Others may go away because of, it may be due to offenses, that they didn't deal properly with devotees. They may, have a, they may have a strong influence of rajas and tamas in their nature, and they may deal harshly with devotees, and they get bad relationships. And this, because of their heaviness and character and in dealing with others, it may cause them to go away from Krishna consciousness. It can be due to offences. But it can also be more commonly due to negligence in practice, that people don't practice very strictly. They, they don't do the chanting regularly and they don't make a great effort to engage in devotional service. They're more looking for a place to just eat and sleep and they don't really want to commit themselves and do some real honest 
uh, endeavor and honest service on behalf of Lord Krishna. So that, you know, they have a lazy nature, they may go away from Krishna consciousness. So these are some reasons why people go away. You uh, understand? Thank you, Maharaj. So, so how do we bring them back into Krishna consciousness? Because sometimes, you know, one may go back to material life, then you, I guess some people also find again how disgusting it is. <laughs> so they know again what it's all about to come back. Well, the, as a devotee. People have to know what, what level they should be in Krishna consciousness, you know. There will be different for different people. Like I said, somebody is living full-time in the temple and somebody else is a congregational devotee. They come maybe once a week on the weekend, come to visit the temple like that. And so some people get initiation, not everybody gets initiation. People, you have to understand what they're capable of. So when we bring people back to Krishna Consciousness, someone's been in Krishna Consciousness, we want them to come back, you have to make some effort to bring them back and to make them feel welcome and make them feel comfortable. And we did see, for example, I remember one time, there, was, there were some sannyasis, uh, Prabhupada disciples, and they were sannyasis, and they had gone out of ISKCON and gone to the Gaudiya Mat and they would taken shelter of one of Prabhupada's god-brothers and they would already taken sannyas from Prabhupada. But after Prabhupada departed, they were not very satisfied with the arrangement. You know, it was the zonal Acharya days. And so they were not very satisfied with the arrangement and they went to Prabhupada's god-brothers and took shelter there and took instruction from them. And so at one point there was an, att an attempt to bring them back. And they came, but they were not happy. And there was uh, even some little criticism from others about them. You know, that, oh, they were, in, they were with us and they went there, they went to these other people, and now they're coming back. And so they didn't feel comfortable. So bringing people back into Krishna consciousness, you have to really be able to take care of them and to guide them and to give them shelter. You have to really make sure that there's a good mood there and that people are willing to embrace them and bring them back into Krishna Consciousness. And some, that's a difficult thing sometimes because you get, we have all kinds of people within our movement and sometimes people will come by and say something which is really not very nice. And just that one remark from one person, that can be enough. And they think, okay, that's it, I don't want to come back to ISKCON. So it's really a delicate thing to try to bring people back into Krishna Consciousness. But it's certainly very, very nice, very good if you can do it. We do try, we do make efforts, we do welcome people to come back. And sometimes it works, sometimes people do come back, but not everyone, not everyone. And some people who have been big leaders in ISKCON, they have come back. We see some of them coming back. You know, there are people, you, you could almost say they never really went away. Although maybe they changed their position. Maybe they were leaders and managers and they come back in a more humble way, not so uh, prominent. So we welcome them back also. We know they have a lot to offer. We do try to encourage them in Krishna Consciousness. It's, it's a delicate job though. I mean, you just have to be very careful that the, nobody says anything unpleasant to them because that can be the problem. That people, you know, don't like to be criticized. Maharaj, thank you very much. I really appreciate the points. Uh, you put in realizations. Thank you. 
Hare Krishna. All right, now go ahead, do this exercise very quickly. In fact, maybe you could just simply speak Recording now. Stopped. Maybe without even going into a group, you could simply tell me some of the qualities of a sadhu which you find particularly inspiring. Anyone? You Recording have, in progress. You have, a, you have a thought about this? You must have been thinking about it while we were talking. So, which particular quality of a sadhu do you find most inspiring? Are there are people who have raised hands. Yes, okay. Let's take some. The initial Prabhu, please go on. Uh, Hare Krishna, actually, I forgot the hand down. Uh, uh, okay, Karnataka Maharaj, please go on. Yeah, Hare Krishna, Prabhu, uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, the one thing which I really feel inspiring is that a sadhu always keeps on chanting and he loves to hear about Lord. Like, uh, uh, here in Delhi, Gopal Krishna Goswami Maharaj uh, always keeps on chanting. He always has his hands in his feet bag. And whenever he's, whenever he's not talking, and he always tells us that we should do our chanting very seriously and sincerely, and in the morning also. And we should always be engaged in devotional services. That is uh, the way of true happiness. And he always said, tells us that we should hear about the Lord always. And keep on, like, whenever we are doing something, we should put on some uh, tape or something which like on like here in youtube you should listen lectures so this way uh, uh, by this i really get uh, inspired and uh, he tells us that you should, by this you, you will forget all the miseries of material existence and slowly you'll be freed from all the material associations and you'll be free from all the three modes of nature so uh, like i uh, like i what is my plan is i always do chanting mostly i try to do it in the morning only itself and this way, and I always uh, put on a lecture whenever, whenever I mean, in the morning and in the, during the day also whenever I get time. Whenever I'm doing something which is uh, uh, which, which involves physical labor. So that time I keep on, you know, uh, listening to the lecture. This way I really, uh, it really helps me out uh, from getting away from the miseries of life. Okay. Thank okay, you. very good. Thank you, Manaji. Very nice. Thank you. Yes. Mahavir Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, please accept my humble obeisances, Maharaj. So actually the quality of sadhu which is mentioned in the verse uh, here uh, is basically the tolerant uh, part and actually uh, many times uh, we are, uh, we read uh, Shikshashtakam also in the temple and uh, we have to, uh, we are reminded again and again by hearing in the lectures, reciting uh, Chaitanya Shikshashtakam that we have to be uh, more than tolerant than a tree. So, a tree actually always stands in winters and summers and uh, whenever anybody is there, whether good or bad, it offers the shade in the summers and it offers also fruits. So by the uh, quality of uh, this tolerance, uh, we can basically uh, develop by associating with the sadhus or following their instructions because when we follow the activities of devotional service, this uh, tolerance is developed uh, because we see that uh, the, the sadhus or the pure devotees, advanced devotees, whenever they are in a very, very difficult situation or provoking situation, they always tolerate. So by looking into their demeanor and trying to uh, take the uh, dust of their lotus feet and uh, thinking that sometimes we can also follow them and pray to the Supreme Lord that we can also acquire this quality of tolerance. Thank you, Maharaj. Oh, okay, yes. So you're talking more about tolerance of physical conditions, but also... Uh, yes, physical conditions as well as uh, whenever there is some uh, verbal statements given by someone, whether devotee or not devotee, which is, which is not very pleasing to the mind and which, uh, which basically provokes a reactive attitude in the mind. So we have to just learn to tolerate so that we don't commit uh, any offense and we protect our bhakti. Okay. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes. Thank you, Krishna. Uh, Maharaj, to me also, uh, this quality of tolerance uh, that attracted me much. Because uh, if any sadhu he is tolerant, it means he is uh, fully uh, uh, dedicated to the instructions of Krishna and Guru, because otherwise it's not that easy to tolerate uh, any situations. So if 
Dadu is told and it means he is fully surrendered. So that that really attracts. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh -huh. Okay. Sometimes you know there were incident. There was an incident like, for example, in Srila Prabhupada's uh, preaching, there was an incident one time, and there was a big pandal. And there was a young man in the audience and he was addressing Prabhupada and, and Prabhupada told him to come up on the stage and the boy came up on the stage and then he began to argue with Prabhupada and it became a big argument, you know. Prabhupada was saying, you answer my question and the boy was saying, no, you answer my question and Prabhupada said, no, I'm not your servant, he said, you should answer my question. And it was, it was a big argument, you know. And some people were upset and they said, Srila Prabhupada should be more tolerant, that he should be tolerant. They, and some people were disappointed. They said, Prabhupada should not have got so angry with the young man. Are you familiar with this incident, which is described in Lila Amrita? No, no, I have not remember. No. Anyway, the point was there, uh, you see, Prabhupada got angry at the boy because the principle is that in approaching a spiritual teacher, uh, there has to be submission. You cannot approach the spiritual teacher in a challenging manner. And so Srila Prabhupada was in pointing this out to the young man. The young man was, he wanted that he should challenge Prabhupada. He was challenging Srila Prabhupada. So Srila Prabhupada was telling him, you know, that you cannot talk like this, you know, that you have to answer my question. And the man was getting, the young man got angry and Prabhupada also got angry at him and, <laughs> and there's a bit of an argument. So some people, they didn't understand Srila Prabhupada's point that in order to approach the spiritual teacher, there has to be submission. And sometimes, you know, just like anger, you know, the, 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 the sadhu, the, the very advanced, elevated acharya may get angry. Now, anger, and Prabhupada also talked about his own spiritual master. That he said, my spiritual master, he said he was Nashinga Guru, you know, he could get very angry sometimes. And he would chastise. And he, Prabhupada also told us how he got chastised one time by his spiritual master. So the spiritual master can get angry. And some people may not understand. They may think, oh, he should be more tolerant. But what, what should you tolerate? <laughs> you see, spiritual master's duty is to educate and to train people. The spiritual teacher is guru, and guru means heavy, and so he may be heavy in authority, not just heavy like an elephant in weight, but he's heavy in authority, and he demands that authority. There has to be that submission to the guru, and then the relationship can be successful. So sometimes devotees, we can be very sentimental and we can talk, oh, that the sadhu shouldn't get angry, he should be tolerant and like that. But we have to understand the proper use of anger in the service of Krishna. I think there's an interesting book on this also. His Holiness Bhaktivikaswami published one book about, uh, uh, what was it now? Uh, Something about speaking, speaking, speaking strongly speak, yeah, speaking strongly on Krishna's service, and he gives many examples about how you know Prabhupada also got quite angry with people and spoke strongly to them. And so we may think, oh, he's not he's not tolerant. <laughs> he should be more tolerant. He should be more gentle. <laughs> So some people, you know, we, we can be sometimes a little bit uh, sentimental about these things. We have to be careful when you talk about being tolerant. Yeah, it's an ornament of a sadhu, but what is tolerance, you know? And certainly Prabhupada tolerated a lot. 
to go and he had to tolerate the, the, the boat ride all the way from India to America and he had to tolerate so many uh, foolish hippies, drug addicts in the Lower East Side of New York. Prabhupada put up with all of these kind of people. He tolerated not having any money and living there in America, penniless practically. He, he that was real tolerance. But when he wanted to spread Krishna consciousness and to instruct people and train people in Krishna consciousness, sometimes he had to show the other side. He had to show and sometimes some anger in order to get things done. He had to let people know, you know, this is not the standard. This is not correct. Do things properly. And Prabhupada wanted the Krishna consciousness should have a particular standard. The, the temples must be properly organized. Everything must be clean. Don't put the instruments on the floor. It must be regular program. Everything must be done punctually and things like this. So Prabhupada was very strict in these things. But for his own self he could tolerate. But for preaching Krishna consciousness, he would sometimes get angry and use his anger to push, the, to enforce the message of Krishna onto others and to convince people about Krishna consciousness. Krishna Maharaj, may I ask one thing which you just mentioned about from uh, Prabhupada Leela Amrit? Yes. Uh, Maharaj, you mentioned that Prabhupada uh, was saying uh, to the young boy, uh, to answer his question first and vice versa. So in that way, uh, what was the thing that Prabhupada was trying to push to get things done uh, to the young boy? Or what was the intent actually? Well, the intent was that Prabhupada wanted the young man to understand that you want to get spiritual knowledge, you first of all, you have to submit yourself to the spiritual authority. You, yes, ma'am. You know, try to understand the absolute truth by approaching a spiritual master, right? And how to approach this? Tadvidi pranipatena. The first thing is pranipatena. You have to submit yourself. And then you, yes, can, then you can put questions. So Prabhupada wanted to make that point to all the devotees and to the audience. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Understood, Maharaj. Okay. So, there are three more people who have raised hands. To all right, quickly then we'll just hear a couple more. Sri Ram Prabhu, please go on. Thanks, so Maharaj. Maharaj, one of the quality which I get more inspired is uh, the sadhus constantly being engaged in the service of the Lord. Uh, my Guru, Jayapada Maharaj, who is even in this present situation, who has been partially paralyzed also, is still continuing to preach and uh, also utilize the Zoom and other uh, online media to preach more. So he is constantly being engaged, which is a source of inspiration for me. Yes, wonderful. Thank you. Yes, yeah, an inspiration for our whole society. Thank you very much. Very nice. Yes, one more. Murari Prabhu. Okay, just Krishna. Mataji, please go on. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes, uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. So I, I was thinking about mercifulness. About and, what? Uh, mercifulness. Mercifulness, okay, yes. Yes, I, I see it uh, like uh, there is very big, uh, uh, how to say, uh, putting up, putting away our own personal things before the benefit for the others also and uh, uh, because because it is like by the preaching uh, process by sankirtan or some other things you are going out and you can, you you can do so many other things but for the benefit for others you you are going uh, there and uh, trying to trying to help the others and uh, the way also how to achieve this i was thinking about uh, to learn to forgive to others when when they are harsh to 
two ads or, or, or like this. So, so yes, I was thinking like this. Okay. So are you going to develop this quality in yourself? Yes, I, I trying. <laughs> What's your plan? Uh, uh, trying to uh, for, forgive to others when they are not so pleasing to me <laughs> or to <laughs> others. <laughs> and, uh, and also trying to give them Krishna consciousness even even I, I, I'm thinking something else of them or you know <laughs> yes okay Prabhu thank you all right thank you very much we'll go ahead let's see here all right text number 22 symptoms of a sadhu text 22 such a sadhu this is external symptoms, engages in staunch devotional service to the Lord without deviation. For the sake of the Lord, he renounces all other connections such as family relations and friendly acquaintances within the world. Engaged constantly in chanting and hearing about me, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the sadhus do not suffer from material miseries because they are always filled with thoughts of my pastimes and activities. So this text 23, we're hearing some of the nice qualities of the sadhus, right? They're he mentions about renouncing other connections such as family relationships. So, how do we understand this? Does this mean everyone has to be a sannyasi? Yes? Do we have to give do we, do we have to give up our family? Shall I say, Maharaj? Yes. We don't have to give our family, but we have to fulfill our responsibility in such a way so that uh, we uh, advance ourselves in the devotional service and also make our dependents uh, take up Krishna consciousness. And that way we can, uh, we can basically fulfill our duties. What should be the devotee's attitude towards the family? They, they should basically uh, not be attached to, the, to them and they should just fulfill their responsibility because uh, whatever the role they are playing, uh, so they should basically, if they have a son, they have to um, uh, fulfill the responsibility of getting the uh, son uh, to basically engage in some job so that he can earn his livelihood and if uh, anyone has a daughter, then he has to make sure that she gets married and then she can uh, get settled down and one then can spend more time in devotional service activities. Yes, right. Family relationships. A devotee shouldn't be neglectful. We have responsibilities. At the same time, internally the commitment is to Lord Krishna and the attachment is to Krishna. But at the same time, a devotee is not neglectful of his duties as a father and as a husband. He can keep his wife with him, he can keep the family with him, but ultimately his duty is to Krishna. And friendly acquaintances within the world, does it mean we don't have any friends anymore? If we're to totally renounced, we don't, we don't keep any friends? No, we have friends, but our friends are also in relation to Krishna consciousness. We try to, we don't just pass the time discussing the material problems of the family and the economic situation and the stock market and the security situation but we try to cultivate krishna consciousness discuss krishna conscious topics with our friends and this way we can live in the world and as described here 
remembering the Lord, chanting His glories and chanting His holy name. And this way we transcend all the miseries of material life. All right. So this, yes, Maharaji, you have a question or a no, comment? Uh, so, uh, Maharaj, can I add on to it, uh, if you don't mind, if you permit me? Yes. Like, uh, we can say in family also, we can make our children Krishna consciousness, Krishna conscious, and we can engage them in Krishna conscious activities also, so that they can also help us in doing service towards Lord. That way we'll be able to do more service. Yes, it's very good if you can bring the family into Krishna consciousness. It's not easy, <laughs> very difficult, but if you can do it, wonderful. Very nice if you can bring your family into Krishna consciousness. That is real family life. Like in the, in, from starting also we can preach them that uh, you have to do a color, like, in, like they're small, uh, do a coloring in uh, Krishna, in Krishna pictures and you can, you know, that engage other children also of their group, age group. Yes. These yes, that's right, yeah. Art, their painting and colouring can be in Krishna consciousness. So Games, we, games also, we can engage them in Krishna conscious games also. Right, Krishna conscious games, yes, very good. <laughs> that's very nice. We always want to be in somehow in, in thought of Krishna and Krishna's activities. All right, going ahead, text 24. Would someone like to read this? Yeah, yeah please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, we have to seek the association of such devotees. For this reason, we have begun the International Society of Krishna Consciousness. There are many uh, mercantile, scientific and other associations in human society to develop a particular type of education or consciousness, but there is no association with, uh, which helps us, uh, one, to get free from all material association. SB 3.25.24 per yeah. Thank you. Right. So, particular purpose of this gone to give us that association, to get us free from all material association. So this is the purpose of ISKCON, this education, consciousness. So many other societies are there, but none of them help us to get free from material association. All right, now here we come to this wonderful verse, another very important verse, which is in this chapter. And I think it's also one of your memorization verses, all right? I hope you've all learned it. Do you know it? Let's all chant it together. Satam prasangam mama virya samvido bhavanti ritkam narasayana kata tushosana dasha pavarga vatmani all right, that's a very important verse, well known. The association of pure devotees, Satampar Sangha, all right, there's an association of pure devotees. And what will happen in the association of pure devotees? There will be discussion of the pastimes and activities Bhavanti Ritkarna Rasayana Kata, which are very pleasing and satisfying to the ear and to the heart. And the karna, the ear, and rit, the heart. Bhavanti Ritkarna Rasayana Kata. And by cultivating such knowledge, one gradually becomes advanced. Does Joshanad Ash Apavarga Vartmani? Vapa Varga Vartmani, right? The path of liberation. We become advanced on the path of liberation. By cultivating the knowledge, we become advanced on the path of liberation. And then, Shradhara Tir Bhaktir Anukramishyati. And then, he is freed and his attraction becomes fixed. Then, real devotion and devotional service begin. 
So Shraddha, Rati, and Bhakti. Shraddha, this Shraddha, this is actually Asakti, and then Rati, at, attach, Rati taste, and Bhakti, this is actually Prema Bhakti, real devotion. Real devotional service begins. So Shraddha, Rati, Bhakti, they follow one after another. Um, so here's Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary on this verse. Only by association with devotees does the mind develop attraction to the Lord. The stages are described here. So first comes association with the devotees, and then the mind will develop some attraction for the Lord. The previous verse mentioned that association should be desired. Then faith first arises. You may remember from the nectar of devotion when you studied Bhakti Shastri, you studied that verse by Rupa Goswami, Adoshratha, right? In the beginning, there is faith. But before you get faith, there has to be association with devotees. Because you don't get faith just on its own. It doesn't come from nowhere. It doesn't just come out of the air. You get that shraddha from the devotees, from the association with devotees. So the faith arises, and then, through the association of devotees, if the quality of one's association is not so good, then it will be bhajana kriya. The association will bring us to bhajana kriya. But, but the pastimes of Krishna are not so pleasing, not so nectarian. But if you get very good association, as if it's prasangam, then my pastimes become nectar for the ear. And thus, and this causes Anartha Nivriti. So we want to get that, not just Bhajana Kriya, we want to get through Anartha Nivriti. So when you get the best association, this Prasanga, right? Satam Prasanga, Mama Virya Prasangam, the best association, then that will bring us through Anartha Nivriti, which is the difficult stage. And then we continue regularly hearing and we get nishta, we become fixed. Then narrations produce direct realization of my good qualities. And so nishta brings this realization and good qualities. And then topics, these topics then produce ruchi or taste and they're pleasing to the ear and the heart. Ritkarana Rasayana. They please the ear and the heart. And so the ruchi, the taste, should be has to come. And then after taste, then asakti. Asakti meaning detachment from everything material, strong faith. And then after asakti, then bhava and rati for the Lord. Bhava meaning that that awakening of ecstatic love for the Lord, and finally, prema, the, the highest stage, the ultimate goal. So the bhakti explained by me now will be preached in the world following this sequence. Now this is the sequence which we have learned earlier, right? Adoshada tata sadhu sango tapajana kriya anarta nevriti tato nishta ruchistata. Like that. So it's all there. The different stages are described here from this verse in Srimad Bhagavatam. All right, going ahead. Devahuti has some questions. Devahuti asks What kind of devotional service would be suitable for me to immediately attain your lotus feet? And what is the mystic yoga system that completely ends material existence and leads to the ultimate goal, the Supreme Personality of Godhead? This is Devahuti's questions. How many ways can we understand that yoga? So these questions, 28 and 29. 
and we will see the answers to 28. The answer to 28 will come in, t in this chapter, text 31 to 44. What type of bhakti is suitable for me? It's described in text 31 to 34. And then the other question, what is the gyan by which we understand tattvas? That's answered in chapters 26 and 27. And the fourth question, what is the yoga mentioned by which one is aimed at the Lord for liberation and how many limbs does it have? That's answered in chapter 28. So you can see Devahuti's questions coming up. The first question in 25, answered in 25, and then 26 and 27, and then 28, chapter 28. Right? Going ahead, this, this text 29, the Bhakti Yoga system is just like an arrow aiming up to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This bana or arrow is so sharp and swift that it goes directly to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, penetrating the regions of impersonal Brahman and localized Paramatma. Prabhupada gives a powerful description of Bhakti Yoga, how it surpasses Brahman and Paramatma. So compared to an arrow, this bana or arrow and it goes straight through all these other regions, goes straight to the Supreme Lord. Texts 31 to 44, which are describing this yoga system, this Sankhya Yoga, described here, we have a quote from text number 31. Sri Maitreya said, after hearing the statement of his mother, Kapila could understand her, pur her purpose and he became compassionate towards her because of being born of her body. He described the Sankhya system of philosophy, which is a combination of devotional service and mystic realization, as received by disciplic succession. Lord Kapila said, this is text 32, the senses are symbolic representations of the demigods and their natural inclination is to work under the direction of the Vedic injunctions. As the senses are representatives of the demigods, so the mind is the representative of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The mind's natural duty is to serve, right? This is indicating that devotional service surpasses liberation. You can see the example that the, the senses are like demigods and the senses are controlled by the mind. So the mind is compared to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Just as the demigods are under the control of the Supreme Lord, so the senses are under the control of the mind. But the mind's natural duty is to serve. Now we ask you to look through these purports and explain how bhakti is superior to yoga and mukti. List Hare reasons. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Uh, Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, can I, uh, can you, please, do, if you don't mind, can you explain this, this uh, paragraph once more? Explain what? This, uh, this thing which you explained uh, just now, can you explain once more? This one about the senses and the demigods? Yes, Maharaj. All right. So Lord Kapila is describing the Sankhya Yoga system and he's explaining that the senses are like representations of the demigods. 
You know, each of the senses, of course, they're controlled by different demigods. Right? So he's giving, an, Lord Kapila is giving an example. He said, the, the inclination of the senses is to work. And they're meant to work under the direction of the Vedic injunctions. The Vedas are there to guide us, tell us what we should do, what work we should do, what work we should not do. So the senses are like that. They have to be engaged. The senses have to be engaged in work under the direction of the Vedas. And the, the senses are representations of the demigods. As the senses are representatives of the demigods, the mind is the representative of the Supreme Lord. So the relationship between the senses and the mind. The mind controls the senses. Higher than the senses is the mind, right? The mind is like the driver of the chariot or the reins on the chariot and the horses are the senses. So the mind is controlling the senses. So the mind, the mind is like the representative of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. At the same time, the mind's natural duty is to serve. We're meant to, the mind's duty is to serve. Not, my mind is not meant to control. The mind's duty is to serve and should, be, should act under the direction of the Vedic injunctions. The Vedas are there to guide the mind. We should know what are the teachings of the Vedas. And the, this way the mind should direct the senses to act. So this is discussed in the purport, text number 32. Thank you, Maharaj. And then, if we look through this these section of verses here, 32, 33, 34, then 36 and text 41, then they will give different reasons why bhakti is superior to yoga and mukti. This is an important question. We should, under, we should understand we should be familiar with the answers. How to explain that bhakti is superior to yoga and mukti? Would any of you like to offer an answer to this question? Why is bhakti superior to yoga and mukti? Can you think of some reasons? Only man of the Prabhu's hand is raised by marriage. Yes, Prabhu. Thank you, Mara. I was thinking because it aims at establishing a original relationship with Krishna. Bhakti is directly, um, yeah, it focuses on that our, our original nature. It's not about achieving anything it's not about achieving mystic powers it's not about some selfish type of liberation but it's the original constitutional position so in that way it's superior uh -huh. so. yes yes we can also mention that in order to take up bhakti one first of all has to be liberated you have to come to the liberated platform in order to engage in bhakti. That's described in the 18th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Brahma Bhuta Prasanatma Na Sochati Na Kanchati Sama Sarvi to Bhuteshu Mad Bhaktim Labhate Param. Right? You have to, we have to be Brahma Bhut in order to take up devotion. So we have to be liberated in order to do bhakti. And we also see that with yoga and mukti, there's no real activity. It's all negation. Mukti, generally when we talk about mukti, we're simply talking about 
impersonal liberation. In yoga, what do they do? They just simply sit, nothing, no activity or samadhi, they're in trance. But bhakti is based on activity. Bhakti is therefore practical and powerful because there's positive engagement for the devotee in bhakti. And that engagement of the senses is not there with yoga and mukti. So these are some reasons about the superiority of bhakti. You understand? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, so you can look over that before tomorrow. Uh, please look over, make a note of these verses, 32, 33, 34, 36, and then 41. And this is also one of the questions on the uh, exercises on the chapter. Mm -hmm. All right, so Kapila prescribes what does he prescribe what does he prescribe what someone can read this Kapila prescribes what kind of bhakti Ibra bhakti therefore persons whose minds are fixed on the Lord engage in the intensive practice of devotional service that is the only means for attainment of the final perfection of life okay Final perfection of life, the Tivrena Bhakti, right? We want to come to that stage, fixed on the Lord. The mind will not wander. The mind will be fixed. Intensive practice, by intensive practice of devotional service. And how will we achieve that? We have to practice intensely. Okay, a final quote. From Srila Prabhupada. Someone like to read this? First of all, the mind should be engaged at the lotus feet of the Lord very steadily and naturally. Because the mind is the matter of the senses, and when the mind. Sorry, Shishtanai Prabhu, because there was a background noise. You can go on reading, Sachitanai Prabhu. First of all, the mind should be engaged at the lotus feet of the Lord, very steadily and naturally. Because the mind is the master of the senses, when the mind is engaged, all the senses become engaged. Become engaged. That is Bhakti Yoga. Okay. So that is Bhakti Yoga. Alright, so that's the conclusion of our PowerPoint here. So, are there any questions on this chapter? Mahavir Prabhu has raised hands. Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, please accept my humble obeisance, Maharaj. Uh, actually, I have one question regarding the definition of Sankhya, uh, which was given uh, in this purport by Kapil Muni, that uh, it is a combination of mystic realization and devotional service. So what is the significance of mystic realization? Well, we hear about that as we go on. As we go through the other chapters, you'll, you'll get some understanding of what is being referred to by mystic realization. This is not exactly a definition, but that's just a, a description, <laughs> the kind of description of Sankhya. You know, we can't really define it like that. Okay, Maharaj, and then in the uh, one of the commentary given by Vishma Chakravarti Thakur for one of the purports you just now shared, uh, it was mentioned about uh, this uh, bhajan kriya. When we do not have the association in the perfect way or an excellent way, we achieve bhajan kriya, not the anarthni vritti. So, uh, not having association perfectly or in an excellent way, what does that mean? And bhajan kriya is the uh, sum total of the activities of devotional service. Is that correct understanding? Bhajana Kriya, is the, that's the result of the, the hearing. If the association is not so good, not the best, 
then the result of that hearing and chanting will be that we're doing simply bhajana kriya, that we haven't actually come through the anartha navriti. To get through, to get up to the anartha navriti and to remove all the anarthas, we have to have the best, the highest kind of association. Highest kind of association, Maharaj, would mean that association of advanced and pure devotees. Yes. And then bhajan kriya would mean that uh, it will basically result in uh, chanting and hearing more. More of chanting, more of hearing. Yes. Okay. Is there anything else associated with bhajan kriya or only chanting and hearing are the two activities? They are the foundation, the roots of the creeper of devotion, hearing and chanting, that's the foundation of our bhakti. When we hear properly, then we will be chanting and the remembrance will also naturally come. So these three activities primarily constitute bhajan kriya, uh, chanting, hearing uh, and remembering. Yes, but you can also say offering prayers is also bhajana kriya. Worshipping the Lord's lotus feet, just like worshipping the lotus feet, you come to visit the holy place, that is worshipping the Lord's lotus feet. The holy place represents the lotus feet of the Lord. That service is also there. Simply by serving the Lord, then we're also doing bhajana kriya. It's not that bhajana kriya is only hearing and chanting. But certainly hearing and chanting is very, very important and that is the root of our, that is the real foundation to our bhakti. So Prabhupada always emphasizes the importance of hearing and chanting. Our other kinds of devotional service will not have so much effect without proper hearing and chanting. Yes, Maharaj. And in one of the Prabhupada lectures, uh, it was mentioned that when we meditate on the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord, we can basically stop our material current. So, uh, meditating on the lotus feet of the Lord means that we meditate on the lotus feet in the Archvigra form in the temple or we uh, meditate on the signs of the lotus feet of the left foot and right foot, which are basically 18 or 19 symbols, like there is a corn shell, then there is a barley corn. Yes. All the so, what is exactly the meditation on the lotus feet? Well, it could be either way. You can meditate on the lotus feet of the deity, you can meditate on the different symbols on the lotus feet of the, uh, the Lord. There's no difference. Oh, thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Murari Prabhu, please go on. Yes, uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. I would like to ask you about the. Uh, the association of devotees were were mentioned as very important or the sadhus. So uh, like in practical like in uh, our society we have many times like association with uh, many devotees, different kind of devotees and uh, uh, not Everybody expect uh, that other devotees which are preaching, like as sadhus, you know, or like uh, elevated devotees. And uh, so, so I want to like to ask you, what, what is the difference, you know, uh, to 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 accept actually uh, the, the devotees as a sadhu? You, you get my point? Well, we have to try to associate with Prabhupada. You know, in our society, ISKCON, Srila Prabhupada is the founder Acharya. And we get our association from Srila Prabhupada as the founder Acharya. We hear Prabhupada's lectures, we read Prabhupada's books, and the devotees who are preaching and giving lectures they should be presenting Srila Prabhupada's teachings. So they speak according to the realizations of Srila Prabhupada's teachings. So everyone, we all have the opportunity to associate with our founder Acharya. He's a Shiksha Guru for all the devotees, right, in ISKCON. He's the ultimate Shiksha Guru. 
So we associate with Srila Prabhupada through his books and through his lectures, and the devotees who are speaking, they're also presenting Srila Prabhupada's message and Srila Prabhupada's teachings. So we should see we should see the devotees in that manner, that they're all representatives of the founder Acharya. Now, different devotees, will, some people will be more expert and more powerful than others. Some people, they're, you know, they're very charismatic and somehow when, when they speak, they can, it can be very animated and it can have a, you know, quite an effect on the audience. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be very powerful and purifying, although it may be very charismatic and very animated, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll get the purification. The purification comes by the, the content. The content has to be through the parampara. They have to present the message of the parampara. So we're practicing Krishna consciousness in that light with the strength of the parampara, that they're giving the, the message, the teaching. And they deliver us. You understand my point? Yeah, yes, Maharaj. I, it's very ni nicely you explained it. We even instruct people that taking initiation in ISKCON means you're a member of ISKCON. You're not particularly identifying with just one particular guru, but you're the member of ISKCON, and ISKCON is all under Srila Prabhupada, who is the founder Acharya. So we can hear, we can go and hear from all the different devotees, and we are encouraged to do that. You know, but no spiritual master will say, don't hear other gurus, just hear me. We always encourage the devotees, go and hear other people, go and hear the different devotees speak. It's important to hear from his different devotees. Don't just limit yourself to, oh, I only hear from my guru. That's not the mood in ISKCON. We want to hear from everyone. Try to hear us wherever we get the opportunity. Okay. Yes, thank you. All right. Is there any other question? All right. Then we'll meet. So we'll meet tomorrow. And please look over chapter 25. If you have any more questions, we'll try to take them up tomorrow. And also look over 26 because it's a big chapter. So try to be familiar with the content. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada ki. Go back to Vrinda ki.